right, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the first of our Hawkeye 360 Board of Advisors Fireside Chats. My name is Caroline Curley, Government Affairs and Public Policy Manager here at Hawkeye. Today's discussion will focus on the terrestrial applications of RF data, specifically the operational value on the ground in Ukraine, um, as well as technology and innovation trends across the national security enterprise. I'm honored to be sharing the stage here today with two of our distinguished Board of Advisors members. First, uh, former Congressman and Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, the Honorable Mac Thornberry. During his time in Congress, Mr. Thornberry focused extensively on fostering innovation across the Department of Defense, reforming and streamlining the department's acquisition structures, and was a key driver in the establishment of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. I fortunately had the pleasure of working for Mr. Thornberry uh, on the Armed Services Committee staff prior to his retirement from Congress. So sir, it's great to be with you again. Additionally, we're also joined by Mr. Robert Cardillo, former director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Mr. Cardillo has extensive leadership experience across the DOD and IC, previously serving as deputy director of the DIA, first civilian J2 on the joint staff, um, and was President Obama's daily intelligence briefer. Uh, Mr. Cardillo currently serves as chief strategist and chairman of the board at Planet Labs. So thank you both for being here today. I know we're all looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the current crisis in Ukraine and larger technology and innovation trends in today's larger strategic landscape. Um, first, I'd, I'd like to discuss the role of commercial data in Ukraine. Uh, the current war is arguably the first large-scale conflict where uh, commercial space-based systems are providing unprecedented amounts of shareable and releasable information to support U.S. allies, partners, and operations on the ground. And Mr. Cardillo, as given your time at NGA, you know that having such a large amount of information from both U.S. government and commercial sources really provides a true uh, decision-making advantage for the U.S. Um, and, and our partners, for that matter. So what impact do you think commercial data and open source intelligence are having on the battlefield right now in Ukraine? And do you view this moment in time as an inflection point for the use of commercial data? So one, thank you. And thank you, Congressman, uh, for joining us in this conversation. Um, it is one that I've been in and around and been part of for an extended period. And I do think Ukraine, unfortunately, is providing um, uh, an opportunity for us to somewhat play out some of the um, potential value propositions that we had worked with the Hill on with respect to what ifs and, and how could we extend the value of commercial data in, in such a conflict. Uh, I'll say at the outset, and we can talk more about the downsides, there's, there's two sides to this, right? There's, there's opportunities and in, 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 in advantages, and there's also some risks here, and we should, we should save some time for both. But let me just say at the, at the top level, uh, what I appreciate, what I've learned from, from the experience in Ukraine is that this, this trend in global transparency, of which Hawkeye is a piece of, but uh, many players and clearly not all American players are contributing to, has changed two fundamental things. It, it, it's changed how um, uh, those who seek uh, to do harm must think about their objectives. Uh, President Putin had a narrative uh, that he was seeking to uh, convey to the world with respect to his intentions pre-invasion, and that open, transparent data set uh, provided a different angle on that narrative and enabled, I thought, I think, uh, what, what was a more informed debate. And then two, when hostilities began, it created a sense of, of, of both opportunity and risk, but opportunity in the sense that it allowed the sharing of information in ways that sometimes in my old government jobs was more difficult to do. So there was a leveling, if you will, of that awareness that I think enabled action and response in a, in a coordination that didn't exist before. Great, sir, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, th I think uh, the director makes uh, incredibly important points. Uh, and I do think it is an inflection point when it comes to a, an understanding of the value of commercial shareable data. 
the, the way I think about it, maybe a little more simplistically, is we live in a complicated, dangerous world. There's no way that the U.S. government alone can do everything that needs to be done to defend the country and protect our way of life. We have to have uh, uh, private industry participate. We need all the players we can get on the field. And we have to work with allies and partners in order to accomplish our objectives. And so having commercial data that is shareable with allies and partners really advances our ability to, to do the, the things that we all know need, need to be done. And not only is it shareable, it can be done quicker. And, and I would say lastly, from a political standpoint, sometimes commercial information, and I think Ukraine's a great example, will have more credibility with certain international audiences than if the U.S. government said, oh, I think he's about to come over. Um, and, and that international credibility is also an advantage in why this needs to be in our toolbox to help defend the country. No, I, I completely agree with all that you've said, and I think, as you've highlighted, Ukraine really has shown, shown the value. But, sir, as you know from your time in Congress, just because this technology and capability exists does not mean that it is easily transitioned into the Department of Defense and military services. What do you see as some of the barriers to greater adoption and integration of commercial data within the DOD and, and the IC? And how can the U.S. government and our international partners overcome those challenges? Well, you were kind, Caroline. Of course, you participated in, 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 in what we have tried to do as far in, in the past as far as authorities for bringing greater innovation into the defense effort more, more broadly. So part of it's authorities, part of it is budget, part of it is culture. Um, and, and I do think the, the situation in Ukraine helps advance, as I say, the understanding and, and therefore affects the culture on what's needed and, and how quickly we can do it. I, I have to say, uh, the director has, has participated in this. Congress has been pushing the government to use a greater, to make greater use of commercial sensing data for a while. And, and I think we are seeing some, uh, you know, some fruits of that, but still uh, the contracting mechanisms, how the budgeting and, and how all of that is set up, I don't think we have, have quite sorted out yet. And, and again, so if we need, if the government can't do everything, if we need to get other players on the field, including industry and allies and partners, we can't make it too hard for them to contribute. And, and I think it's still much harder than it needs to be. And so that's acquisition policies we were just talking about. It's also export policies as far as getting that help into the hands of allies and partners. If I could just add to the cultural piece, which I couldn't agree more. Um, and look, I'm, I'm reflecting on my own career. When I came in, almost everything I did as an imagery analyst and as a professional, you know, a, a military analyst at DIA, uh, had to include a top secret badge with a top secret uh, facility with top secret customers and top secret communications because we were the only people that had those capabilities and it was in our country's interest to protect them. Uh, you know, I'm at, I'm at the other end of my career now, but I will tell you my counterparts who are still serving in federal government bring with them that bias the higher the classification, the higher the value. Um, boy, if it's top, top secret, it's better than top secret, et cetera. And, and, and I don't make light of it because it's, it is a challenge because when, when we do find the way to bring that data set in, it's treated a little bit like, well, yeah, but that's only this. And oh, by the way, we didn't control the whole digital flow, et cetera. Do I trust it, et cetera? Which, are, which by the way, those are questions we should ask to the downside here. What I'm finding, though, through this experience in Ukraine is that people are, quite frankly, learning the, the upside, holding those questions in mind, but the upside if you can scale it in the right way. And, and it doesn't say we don't need classified capabilities. It just means we've got a better foundation upon which we can have a common frame of reference. That's for ourselves and our international partners. And then, and then focus those bespoke classified specific government capabilities on top. And to me, that's the win-win. 
Yeah, and in the, the few minutes that we have left here, I'd like to kind of bring this to a, to a more 300-foot level. Um, as we've discussed, the, maintaining the U.S. technological edge and, is a key strategic advantage over our, our adversaries, especially in this era of, of great power competition with, with great powers and peer competitors. How can the U.S. ensure that it maintains its technological edge to be able to compete in today's current climate? Well, I'll start by, by saying <laughs> we, we need this pressure, um, positive pressure uh, from the Hill, uh, pressure along with the wherewithal. So that's the, the permission and then the appropriation to enable it. But I also say, too, is that um, to me, what I believe is the beauty of this, this ecosystem that we, we're all a part of is the fact that, that we've got you know, risk capital, entrepreneurial idea, uh, uh, an innovative culture, both in our commercial industry, but, but in government as well. And if we can just reward that cycle in a way that offers opportunities, you know, rewards progress, but also holds people accountable, to me, I think it's, it's that cycle that's um, you know, uniquely ours, and I think if we could just amplify it. Uh, the congressman mentioned you know, the you know, export controls and whatnot, which again, it's an important aspect of protection. We just need to be mindful that sometimes you can control uh, in a way that, that limits the impact, uh, the, the American impact and, and, and our allied impact. And so now that's not a black and white equation. It's always a debate uh, that we, we need to discuss. But I do think it's that ecosystem with that, that mindset. Yeah, and I, just to emphasize the, the investment point for a second, not only can we not do everything through government, we can't pay for everything <laughs> that needs to be done through government. And, and so one of the key advantages we have in this country, not only is an innovative private sector, but we have a whole investment sector that is interested in, willing to, uh, and able to, help us develop the kind of technologies and capabilities we need for this broader defense effort. Uh, but, but they need to see their investors and they're in it to make some money or have the chance to make some money. And, and I go back to my point, we can't make it too hard for them. I think we're kind of at a point where there needs to be some wins, uh, either in national security technology or dual use technology, um, and if there can be some wins, I think there will be more investment that will follow. So, so, the, so the key for staying on top, back to your basic question is, we need to continue to nurture our innovative base that we have in this country, and investment can help do that. And we have to probably think of partnerships a little broader than we have in the past, where most of the innovation and most of the decision making was government alone. We need to broaden that out a little bit. Again, not only domestically, but with allies and partners too, because we just can't do everything that needs to be done through the government. And here's the hard part. We've got to move faster. Um, you know, most of my career was within the electro-optical sensing capability of the planet. I talked about when the government was only mostly the monopolistic controller of that. Um, it's taken us a good 20 years to move from presidential direction that we had in the early 2000s to create a, a, not just a vibrant but a leading U.S. commercial imaging community, uh, industry. Um, we don't have 20 years uh, to, to get it right next time. Uh, we need to learn the lessons, good and bad. We need to apply them more quickly. Uh, we need to be a little more agile. Well, we are unfortunately out of time, but I think this was a fantastic discussion. Um, thank you both for being here today. As you've highlighted, we're entering an extremely pivotal moment in time, and I think the U.S. space industrial base really is playing a key role in that. Um, so thank you for your participation in, today, in today's conference and moreover for your continued dedication to U.S. national security. So thank, thank you. you and thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.